Hello, I'm Michael Cantrell, and you are listening to the Prison Officer Podcast, a place to have a conversation about the forgotten cops that work in this country's jails, prisons, and correctional centers. A place for me to try to make sense of a career spent working inside the fence with some of the greatest people that nobody sees or recognizes for the important job they do to keep this world safe. If you love this podcast, hit the follow button, or better yet, share with your family, friends, or coworkers. In more than 28 years of corrections, I have used or supervised Pepperball hundreds of times. Now, as a master instructor for Pepperball, I teach others about the versatility and effectiveness of this Pepperball system. From cell extractions to disturbances on the rec yard, Pepperball is the first option in my correctional toolbox. One of the most dangerous times for officers is during cell extractions. Pepperball allows officers to respond with the lowest level of force and still be effective and ready if the situation escalates. The responding officer controls where the projectiles are aimed, how many projectiles are launched, and how rapidly they're deployed. This allows the response to be tailored to the moment. To learn more about Pepperball, go to www.pepperball.com or click the link below in the show's information guide. Pepperball is the safer option first. Welcome back to the Prison Officer Podcast. This week, or this episode, I thought I'd do something a little bit different. Instead of having the regular interview or a discussion on a specific topic, I thought I'd do a little bit of question and answer. You know, I get, there's a form on, if you go to www.theprisonofficer.com, uh, you go down to the bottom and you can send me a message. Um, if that doesn't work, you can send a a message or an email to me at Mike at the prison officer.com. And I do get quite a few messages and questions and, um, you know, support thoughts, different stuff like that. But some of the questions I had seemed like they might be good for everybody to listen to and for everybody to get a little bit from. So uh, that's what I'm going to go into with this episode mostly. Uh, I thought also while I'm here, I would stop and talk about where the Prison Officer Podcast is right now. You know, when I started this podcast, I did it just because I wanted to, I wanted to have a voice out there for the correctional officers who don't normally have one. I never felt like I had a voice out in the public when I was a correctional officer. And so I thought I'd start this podcast and, and try to build up a conversation, a conversation about what we really go through behind those walls and fences, maybe educate the public a little, maybe support you guys a little. Um, but if nothing else, just to start a conversation, because I believe that that is the, the beginning of things happening and things changing. So So when I started this podcast, I had no idea it was going to get this big. Absolutely didn't. Um, So this year, I'm taking a look at some of the, uh, I host this podcast on Buzzsprout. So I'm taking a look at some of the stats for this year. And uh, in the last 90 days, there have been 10,442 people who have downloaded an episode of the Prison Officer Podcast. Uh, Over the course of the last couple of years, there's been 70,000 total. And considering the the first month, I think there was like 400. (laughs) Uh, That's just amazing. I did another count. I'm always interested in this because I did not realize that, I didn't realize that Corrections was such a global family uh, until I got to going with this podcast and looking around and and interviewing some people. But uh, at this point, there have been 104 countries that have downloaded at least one episode of the Prison Officer Podcast. So that's pretty cool. 72% of the podcast downloads come from North America, 12% come from Europe, and then 14% come from Australia and New Zealand. So I find that very interesting, too. So that's kind of where the podcast has been, and you know, it's it's just gotten bigger and bigger. And another thing I want to talk about for a second is this year we got our first full time advertiser, and that is Pepperball. And most of you working out there in detention or corrections know about Pepperball, uh, but they are the sponsor of the Prison Officer Podcast, and I'm really glad to have them on board. Uh, I work for them as a master instructor. 
and I believe in them. I have used pepper balls for more than 20 years during my use of forces and uh, different incidents that we've had. So I just can't say thank you enough to Pepper Ball for being a sponsor of the Prison Officer Podcast. Another sponsor who's just come on board very recently is Omni Real-Time Location Systems. Now, I've been working with Omni for about a year now. Uh, They brought me on as a senior advisor to help them get this company going and uh, brought in my custody expertise because real-time location system with them, that's, that's truly what that means. With their technology... They provide bracelets uh, to the uh, department or to the facility. They put those bracelets on the inmate. And then three to five times a second, that bracelet tells control center where that inmate is uh, within just a few feet. So uh, it's really amazing to take a look at that and see it work. It's really going to change a lot of how we do corrections, I think, uh, to be able to See those blind spots where there are no cameras allowed? Think of your bathrooms, you know, with Priya, and you can't have a camera in there. But I could show you where that inmate is at and where he's located in that bathroom and what his uh, heart rate is. And it's really going to change corrections that we have the ability to do that, that we have the ability to monitor them at that level. So if you get the chance, uh, check out our sponsors. Uh, You can go to www.pepperball.com and check Pepperball out and tell them thank you from the Prison Officer Podcast while you're there. And you can also go to www.omnirtls.com. And if you get the chance, tell them thank you for supporting the Prison Officer Podcast. Before I move into the questions and answers, there's one more group of people who support this podcast who I just want to say thank you to. And uh, some of those have supported me with Buy Me a Cup of Coffee. Uh, I know there's some stuff out there, Patreon, I looked into that, but I liked the idea of Buy Me a Cup of Coffee. If uh, if you really enjoyed an episode, if you like what I said, if you just want to support uh, this podcast, you can click on Buy Me a Cup of Coffee and uh, spend anywhere from $2 up, depending on what you feel that day. And I do appreciate that. It does help uh, defray the costs of running a podcast, which is not always cheap. Also, for those of you that have been to my Etsy store, where we sell a little bit of Prison Officer Podcast merchandise, thank you guys for buying a coffee cup or a a, a mouse pad, uh, that type of stuff. Um, I just really appreciate that you take the time to do that and that you support the Prison Officer Podcast. So what's coming up? Well, I got a couple of things coming up in September. I will be a speaker for the Missouri Correctional Association at the conference up at Lake of the Ozarks, so I'm excited to do that. I've got a couple more speaking opportunities coming up in October and then one in January overseas, uh, but those are going to be uh, for colleges, but I really enjoy that. I love getting getting them excited about leadership and helping them understand maybe a little bit about corrections while I'm at it. So I always enjoy that when I get to go talk to the colleges. I just finished up, and if you guys haven't taken a look on Amazon, Finding Your Purpose, Crafting a Personal Vision Statement to Guide Your Life and Career. Uh, We just finished up that book a few months ago, and it's out on Amazon, available And it is a workbook that teaches you how to make a personal vision statement. I'll walk you through it and show you how it helped me and why I needed a personal vision statement at one point during my career. And it'll walk you through there step by step so that you can create your own personal vision statement to guide you as you take those steps, as you work your way through the career and life. Uh, So if you haven't yet, check out Amazon and take a look at that. Um... I don't have any big announcements yet on the next book. I am working on a uh, putting a lot of my 29 years, the stories, the things that happened, the inmates I worked with, the people I worked with. So I'm working on that. I'm hoping first of the year uh, that we can have some news about that, about when we're going to get it out there and, and get it published. So that about wraps up, you know, the the housekeeping portion of the prison officer podcast. So I think I'll move on to um, the question and answer period. And I hope some of you guys get something out of these these questions and maybe some of the answers that I gave these people that reached out to me. So question number one, um, 
she, I'm not going to read any names or anything, but she said, I have a question. So on my questionnaire for my second interview, I lied about the time frame of me smoking marijuana. I want to tell them the truth that I did it when I was underage in Colorado because it feels wrong to have lied, but I don't want to get in trouble. Is it the right thing to tell them the truth or should I leave it be? I didn't tell them about it. And if they find out, they won't send me to post because of it. I feel wrong morally about it, and I don't want to mess up any chances I have of a position with them. So should I tell them or just leave it alone? I don't know what to do. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to jeopardize anything. Well, here, here's my answer back to her. And I told her, I said, I'm not sure what position you're applying for, but if it is a correctional officer or a police officer position, you are applying for a public trust position. You should tell the truth. Your character is what you will always be judged by when you work in a prison or as a police officer. With that said, marijuana use, experimenting with it when you were young, isn't normally that big of a deal. It should not preclude you from being hired, although lying, on the other hand, is a quick way to get let go from a public trust position. I think you should tell the truth. I think your character is what you will always be judged by. If I was sitting on this board, the fact that you came and told me the truth would hold a lot of sway with me. Now, for the bad part. Telling the truth doesn't always mean that you get away from the consequences. It doesn't mean you get to uh, skip to the next section without having to deal with the bad part. Okay? That's the tough part of always telling the truth. Telling the truth comes with consequences. Telling the truth has repercussions. Sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're bad. But up front, you didn't tell the truth. So if there are repercussions, you should expect that. Now, do I think there should be repercussions for that? If I was sitting on that board, I would probably, you know, give you six months to come back and reapply again. I would be impressed by the fact that you came to me on your own and that morally it was bothering you to have lied. So as a person sitting on that panel, I would have taken that into consideration. But that's not saying that everyone will do that. But at the end of the day, when you walk through prison, when you are a police officer, the only thing you have protecting you and walking with you every place you go is your character. It's your integrity. So above all, that's what matters. Whether or not you get that job isn't the important thing. Whether or not you uphold your integrity, whether or not you show your character, that's the important thing. That was my, um, that's my feeling on that. There may be people, and I'm, I, welcome, uh, I welcome you to send me a message if you think there's a different way to take a look at that. But after my years in corrections, this is the way I, I, hear, I look at it. This is the way I look at it, and this is what I think is important. When you go to your interviews, make sure that you tell the truth. Make sure that you're honest. It doesn't mean there won't be consequences, but you are applying for a position that honesty is the number one thing. Um, next question. So far, it's been a great experience. I come from working at the school district, so what I'm seeing so far is kind of similar. I volunteered to work at a maximum security prison for a month and get some experience. It was definitely different. What do you think the difference is between working minimum and working maximum? Well, that's a really good question. Uh, it's something, um, I guess I could have covered a, a podcast on that, an episode, but, uh, I think it's a really good question. What is the difference between running a maximum security prison and a minimum security prison as far as how you treat the inmates? Do you treat the inmates different? I'm going to say a lot of working at a maximum or a minimum security is the same. A lot of the same things that matter at both, okay? Respect, honesty, being firm. But I will say at a minimum, sometimes you have to take that firm with some common sense. 
I worked at a camp for several years, and uh, although most of my time there was taken up, uh, I was on a response team and I was on a canine unit, uh, it was different. Working in minimum security is not as black and white in some ways as working maximum is. And I think I've always been a rule-oriented person, so I was more comfortable working in the penitentiaries. Uh, I liked having the rules. But even at a minimum, security is still the most important part of your job. And one of the things I saw the most was that we tend to get lulled to sleep sometimes because not as much happens. The danger is still there. It doesn't happen as often. You're not going to see as many shanks at a minimum security as you would at a maximum security. But that doesn't mean that you don't have criminals in there who can show violence and who can attack staff. So you have to keep your guard up. And I do think it's easier working in a maximum security to keep your guard up all the time. You're reminded of it. Um, working at a lower security, you kind of get lulled into that, you know, well, nothing happened today. Always something could happen. So that's one of the things I see. And with minimum security inmates, I have higher expectations of minimum security inmates. Now I'm talking about um, sanitation, work, manners. That's the time I have high expectations of them. I might overlook, you know, walking down the walk at a maximum security and I got an inmate who yells, Hey, asshole, that's kind of expected. Okay. And I'm not going to go do a use of force, get five team members together and a, you know, a launcher to deal with someone calling me a name, but in a minimum security prison, they're going to get pulled aside and they're going to get written up. I'm going to try to take some of their good time because they're within, you know, a few months, maybe a couple of years of being on the street. The whole point of them working down to a minimum security prison is that they're showing that they're ready to go back to population or back to society. And that's not the kind of behavior that we want. I have higher expectations of them. They have more to lose. I don't know. I would never let a camper talk to me like that. I don't know if that makes sense, but that's the way I feel about it. I think that covers it. You have to have, you know, there's times when you have to have some common sense working with the lower security inmates. They're, you're not keeping the the rules. You're not holding the hammer down on them as, as tight as you are maximum security. But there still has to be rules. There has to be guidelines. They have to stay within that framework. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, that just covers a few of my ideas on that. Uh, question number three. This one was a little bit, I guess, antagonistic. <laughs> It says, I have listened to several of your podcasts and I notice you are so sure that you're always right. You come across like everything is black and white, right and right or wrong. And life is just not that way. It's kind of a comment. I don't really know that it's a question. It was a comment that I got, huh? But I will say I am very black and white. I believe in right and wrong. Um, And I will disagree that life has very much middle ground. I don't know that I believe um, that there are that many gray areas in the world. I think people make gray areas as excuses for not making choices. That's the way I look at it. But in my world, there is good and evil. There is right and wrong. And I don't have a lot of compassion for people who live in the gray area. Either you want to go do what's right Either you want to be a productive part of society, either you want to raise your family, take care of your kids, um, make a, make a living, either you want to do that stuff or you make the choice not to. And I know this is going to stir some people up because they're going to start yelling about, you know, oh, the homeless, this, and that kind of stuff. Yes, there are some homeless people. Um, and the ones that are homeless for a short time while they're getting back on their feet, I understand that. But when you've been homeless for four or five years and you're sitting in front of Walmart, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for that. That's a lifetime of choices. It's a lifetime of choices to keep choosing the drugs or the alcohol or the lifestyle, whatever it is that keeps you down. You're making those choices. So um, I am very black and white. And I keep my life 
very black and white without much gray in it. There's right and wrong. There's good and bad. And I know what that looks like. I've always known what good and bad looks like. When you go to prison, I think you get a whole new level of what evil looks like. Because I have looked some evil people in the eyes, and it'll scare most people. But I have also been around good people, and I know the difference. It's easily detectable. You can tell the difference just by looking. But no, I don't believe there's a lot of gray area. I think people who try to convince you that there's gray areas in life, they tend to be people who want to justify doing something wrong. That's the way I look at it. I rarely see anybody that does good, that does the right thing, who's out there trying every day. I don't see those people trying to justify why they can't do it. You only see people justifying about gray areas and why they can't do it when you're dealing with them wanting to do something like drugs or alcohol or or, or whatever other vice they may have. That's the people who say, oh, there's a gray area. And, uh, you know, I got caught up in that. And no, you made decisions. You made decisions. And you're just going to have to accept that and face the consequences. Consequences happen when we make decisions. Some consequences are good. Some consequences are bad. Making no decision is worse than anything. But that's my opinion. Um, Like I said, that was more of a statement. But yes, I do feel that way. I do think that uh, life is very black and white and that you can see the right and the wrong. So, And that's the way I taught my children. Um, I told them, when you're doing something wrong, and this has always worked for me, anytime I was getting ready to do something wrong, my conscience told me. I could feel it in my gut and it said, oh, this isn't quite right. Should you be doing this? And that's a time for a decision. And if most people will pay attention to that, Your gut will tell you, your conscience will tell you when you're about to do something wrong. Uh, Question number four. I have been listening to and enjoying your podcast. I am a couple of weeks away from starting a new job as a deputy jailer in our jail here in town. I am 43 years old and coming into the position as a rookie. Any advice for me? Um, Absolutely. You know, being a rookie... I was a rookie twice. I worked for the state of Missouri for nine years, had lots of experience in corrections, and then I went federal and went to Leavenworth. And when I walked into Leavenworth, nobody looked over and went, wow, there's a guy with nine years in. (laughs) No, they said, there's a rookie. And shut up and listen, rookie. And that's probably one of the first things I can tell you as a rookie. Leadership positions teach the same thing. When you come into a new job, You should spend 90 days listening before you ever implement a change. And that's so you could find out what's working and what's not working um, before you interject your decisions into that new leadership job. Well, being a rookie is kind of the same thing, Um, especially you're going to go in there at 43 years old. It's going to be a little tougher for you. You've already got some ideas made up about how life is. Um, You've already got your work ethic probably built in whether it's good or it's bad it's already a a set work ethic so you're going to go in here with some thoughts about what work should be well that's the wrong way to go in as a rookie Um, i had a lieutenant tell me that god gave you two ears and one mouth and that was to do twice as much listening as you did talking and if i could say anything to most rookies unless you're asking a question you should keep your mouth shut and listen. Open those ears. The, the tools you need to succeed in that career are all around you. Those guys, a lot of them have already done this. They've already dealt with the problem. They've already figured out how to you know, deal with that inmate or that situation. These guys have experience. And the best way for you to get that experience is to open your ears and listen. So that's probably number one of what to do as a rookie. Uh, Number two, study. I know they're going to send you to an academy of some sort, somewhat shorter than others, I know. But when you get done with that academy, you don't know much. That's the time when you want to pull out policy and learn it. 
That's the time when you want to read the housing unit rules so that you know them. You want to become proficient as a correctional officer in that jail or in that prison. You want to be the person that inmates come and ask questions of. When inmates ask you questions, that's because they believe you to be knowledgeable. They won't go ask questions of people who aren't knowledgeable. And making an impact in your jail or prison happens that way. As knowledgeable correctional officers who inmates come to and who they trust, this is a relationship that you can supervise with, that you can lead those inmates, that you can supervise those inmates. Um, so that would be the, the second thing that I would do. Probably the next thing I'd tell you about being a rookie is to guard your reputation, guard your integrity, guard your ethics. Uh, much like I talked about with that first question, uh, it's so important that you don't lie to inmates or other staff. If an inmate comes to you with a question and says, hey, boss, what, what's the answer to this, this, and this? Don't make up an answer. They'll find out you're lying. And once that happens, um, you've lost your credibility and you've lost a lot of your uh, status as a trusted supervisor or a trusted officer. So you don't ever want to do that. You don't want to start lying because you don't know the answers. I talked about being knowledgeable in this job. But if you don't know an answer, honesty, tell an inmate, I don't know. I'll find out. Come back here in 30 minutes. Come back tomorrow. I'll find out what the answer is, but don't lie to them. And kind of on the flip side of that is the importance of the word no. Now, we grow up our entire lives um, as young children and then into our uh, teens and early adults, and we find it tough to tell people no. You know, we feel like we have to make up that white lie you know, when your your cousin invites you over for dinner, but you really don't want to go, so you make up some white lie about not feeling good. And so this becomes a habit, okay? And we learn as we grow up not to just say the word no. And once you go to work in prison, this is extremely important. If an inmate comes up and says, can I do this? And it's not allowed by policy. Don't tell them it's not allowed by policy. Don't tell them it's not uh, somebody else's rule. Don't tell them any of this stuff. Just look at them and say, no, you can't do that. Then if they ask why, you could say, well, the, the rules say that it's not allowed. But don't make up uh, excuses for saying no. And I've seen this happen time and time again. Even when I was uh, moved up into supervision, I had officers who would tell inmates no because the lieutenant didn't want that. Well, that's not the reason. The reason you're telling them no is because you don't want it or it's against the rules or it's against policy. But take ownership. Take ownership of no. Uh, so that's a very important thing there. Don't lie to them and learn how to say the word no. It, it's... Once you learn to do it, it will improve your whole career. And finally, and this isn't just for rookies. This is one of my rules that I've always stood with when people have asked me. And I learned it by accident. I had uh, I was doing a detail one time for the captain. Uh, I was working with a couple of others. And, and they took off, and I was the last one. And I, I didn't know where the others had went to. So I went back to the office where I was originally given my, my orders, and I said, uh, what do you need me to do now? Well, the captain looks up at me, and he goes, what? I said, I'm done with that task. I said, what do you need me to do now? And he looks over at me, and he goes, where are the inmates at? Excuse me? He said, where are the inmates at? I said, well, part of them are in the housing unit. Part of them are on the yard. A few of them may be going to mainline right now. He said, then go be where the inmates are at. And I've always remembered that because that is a great rule for working in prison. When you start hiding from your job and your job is monitoring inmates, when you start sitting in your office so that you don't have to watch inmates, so that you don't have to deal with the problems that come up, it's probably time to go find another job because 
That's what we do. You should spend your day trying to be where the inmates are. Stuff doesn't happen where they're not. It only happens where they are. And that's your job is to interdict and stop and, and uh, make sure that rules are being followed and the policies are being followed and that inmates aren't stabbing each other and that hooch isn't being made and tobacco's not flowing and all this stuff. So I think that'd be the final one. I final piece of advice that I would give you as a rookie uh, is be where the inmates are. I guess one more piece of advice I'll give you is, uh, uh, I guess it's been two years now. I put together the prison officer podcast job guide information and guidance to start your career in corrections. And this is on Amazon. It's a great resource. Uh, I put a lot of my tips and tricks in there. Um, in the back of the book, it's, it covers the uh, minimum requirements and the salaries for uh, all 50 states, Department of Corrections, some counties, some private feds. Uh, so it's a good place to go take a look at where you may want to take your career. And right now is a great time to be a rookie. It's a great time to start this career. Pay is going up where it's never been before. The competition for recruitment is as high as I've ever seen it. So uh, right now, being available to be a correctional officer and, and just starting in this uh, can be a really good career move. So take a look and, and see what's the best move for you. Um, where can you make the most money? Where the where you get the most benefits? Where's a good working institution, you know, where they get along, where they have a, a culture of camaraderie and uh, a culture of getting the work done? And I guess finally, I've got one more question. I just finished the basics series of episodes in light of what you were saying regarding officer suicide. I'm sure it would be valuable if you were to dedicate a podcast solely about your on the job perceptions and practices that have helped you and any other practical tips such as managing overtime pressure and how not to be that person who is always asked first and then last to do overtime until you can't see the forest for the trees. Managing sleep, relationships, how to get out of a rut, how to know if you should quit, and ideas of where to reach out for help, support, and camaraderie. Wow, there's a lot to that question. (laughs) Um, Practical tips about my job perceptions and practices that helped me. And I've talked about this quite a bit on the podcast, but um, having something to do outside of work. Nothing against the officers I worked with. But rarely did I go out and drink beer with the guys um, that I had just spent 8 or 16 hours with. When I got off work, I had other activities. I had other hobbies. I had a family. So that was where I I put my, my time and my effort was into them. You know, my family, we liked camping, so we went camping quite a bit. Um, I used to compete in Scottish Highland games where, you know, you wear a kilt and you throw that telephone pole and the Scottish hammer and stuff. I competed in that for several years on the weekends. And um, I guess I liked hunting and fishing also. So I would regularly take a little time to go deer hunt or, or to go fishing. And that was some of the ways that I tried to keep my sanity and tried to keep a focus that wasn't just tied to me being a correctional officer. And I think that's important. I think we can get too tied up in that until that's all we think we are. And I don't know that I ever had that in my head that the only thing I was was a correctional officer. I always kept other options open, even if they were just recreational options or being a father. You know, being able to be identified as something besides a CO, I think helps a lot. Um, are you a volunteer? Are you a father? Are you a church member? Are you a, whatever it is that you enjoy doing, being able to call yourself by another name other than CO, I think is very important. Um, he also asked how to manage overtime pressure. And I don't know that I'm the best one to ask about that. I worked a lot of overtime, you know, I thought we needed the money. I had two children. I put through college. We ran a household. My wife and I, you know, kept a nice household for the family. So part of that and what I felt like my part was, was to make as much money as I could. 
And I did that for good or for bad. Um, I worked a lot of overtime and, and probably would now. I, I have multiple things going on at the same time. I always do. I, I always feel like if I don't have something to do that, you know, if I get bored, uh, I get worried. So I don't know that I'm the best person to tell you how to manage overtime pressure. I will tell you what some of the older staff told me. When overtime's good, don't get yourself so far in debt that you have to work. You know, don't get that motorcycle payment and that camper payment and that house payment and that brand new truck payment, and then you can't make it when the overtime's not there. And I never did that. We always worked. I got the overtime, and then we spent that on what we needed. So I never was spending that money ahead of time. But that would be my... I guess, tip there. And you said, how do you know when you should quit? Um, (laughs) I don't know. I'm like everybody else. I thought about quitting a few times. Um, I didn't. I looked around, you know, make a, make a little list, make the pros and cons. You know, there's a lot to be said about our retirements and our benefits and, uh, the money we can make. Um, so I think I used to sit down when I wanted to quit and I would take a look at that and how would I replace that in my own situation? I have a high school diploma, so I wasn't popping out there with a college degree ready for the, the next company to grab a hold of me. I kind of felt like I was in a, uh, as good a position as I could get at the time I'd worked hard to get there. So I don't know what to tell you exactly about how to know if you should quit. And then finally, you said where to reach out for help, support, and camaraderie. Um, and I've, I've mentioned this before, but I absolutely think uh, if you can get on a team, I think teams are wonderful things. I've been on a team since my, I think, my ninth month of being a correctional officer. I got on E-Squad for Missouri State Penn. And... Ever since then, I was on or in charge of some type of team, whether it was a canine unit or uh, emergency or disturbance squad, correctional special tactics and response team. Uh, So I've always been on a team. And what comes with being on a team is a few things. One, you do gain that camaraderie. You build with this group of people who have similar interests and who uh, are going similar directions. You have the similar goals. And so that's great. But you also have somebody to kind of keep you in line. And that doesn't mean that that's everybody's job. But I have had many people come by and go, you doing okay today? Uh, You don't seem yourself. You're not putting in the effort today. You know, Uh, this isn't like you. And to have somebody who you work with who's honest enough to say, take a look at yourself. Are you representing the team right now? Are you carrying yourself at a level that would reflect the team well? To have people who can be around you and remind you and lift you up in those times, uh, I think makes it very worthwhile to be part of a team. So whether it's a hostage negotiation team or uh, I know there's wellness teams out there, or disturbance control, uh, cert teams, whatever you call it at your institution, uh, by all means, become part of a team. And I think that uh, really helps with a lot of that. Well, that's the five questions I had pulled out. I hope you guys enjoyed some of that, took a little bit from it. It's just my commentary. It's just my thoughts. You don't have to agree with me. Uh, Matter of fact, a lot of people don't, and that's fine. (laughs) Um, If you want to make comments, by all means, go to www.prisonofficer.com, and you can go down to the bottom and send me a message if you have comments about this podcast. Or you can send me an email at mike at the I hope you'll join us uh, in a couple of weeks for the next episode. And be safe out there behind those fences and walls. You are all each other has sometimes. So look out for your, your fellow employee. Have a great day. I would like to take a minute to thank one of our sponsors that make the Prison Officer Podcast possible. Omni RTLS is a company that I've been working with for the last year. I am proud to be part of this team of correctional professionals who have developed the best real-time locating system on the market today. With Omni's real-time location technology, you automatically know the accurate locations and interactions of all inmates, staff, and assets anywhere in your correctional facility, and you have this information in real time. 
Omni is cutting-edge software for today's jails and prisons. It is the only way to monitor every square inch of your facility while still being PREA compliant. Go to www.omnirtls for more information and to make your facility safer today. That's www.omnirtls.com. If you enjoy these podcasts, the best way to support the Prisoner Officer Podcast is to share these episodes with your friends or, or family on social media. Let me invite you to visit www.theprisonofficer.com. If you haven't already, check out the Prison Officer Podcast on Facebook and click that little follow button. Or leave us a message, or better yet, leave us a review. And if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Google, or Spotify, please click the subscribe button. Until next time, I'm Mike Cantrell. Watch your back, and please take care of each other out there behind those walls.